to all of you uh, to our new uh, conference venue, which is um, here, uh, and it's the first <laughs> event, uh, event we are having here. As you see, we have more space, uh, more uh, people can come to our events. We have, uh, I think, a very nice outfit, um, and uh, we have new technology um, and, uh, and lots of new features. Uh, so I think uh, what I want to do first is really thank um, the architect, but also the team, including uh, especially our secretary general, uh, Matt Dunn, and uh, Matt, per perhaps you, you raise your hand, and, and also uh, Giuseppe Porcaro, who's our head of communication and events, who have really worked very hard in putting all of this together. We are not finished yet, so there will be doors, in fact, and there will be some <laughs> air conditioning, um, uh -oh. which is still not, I mean, the, the tubes are there, but the air conditioning is still not yet running, which is why we have the windows open. <laughs> So um, uh, it's a matter of a few more weeks and, and then you'll have a, a completely uh, a fit, um, fit conference suit. So, so welcome again and thank you for coming to, to this first event. Uh, we just heard um, some music. The music <laughs> apparently is very popular uh, in the US and was a recommendation by Jeffrey Frieden to put, put this, this music on. It, it is a song called Hamilton. It's a musical uh, called it's Hamilton. A musical and called two Hamilton. songs from the musical. So I guess I should explain. So Hamilton is a musical. It is the hottest thing in, in, the, in the States. 16 Tony Award nominations, uh, number one Grammy album of the year, go on platinum. And you have to buy tickets a year and a half in advance. Um, and it's the life of Alexander Hamilton. And as you'll find out, Alexander Hamilton is crucial to the creation of the Economic and Monetary Union of the United States. The two songs there were, the first one's called Cabinet Battle Number 1. And it's a rap battle moderated by George Washington between <laughs> Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson over the creation of the first central bank and the refunding of the state's debts and the creation of the financial system. And the second song is called The Room Where It Happens. And it's about the compromise that's eventually struck between Hamilton and Jefferson, where Jefferson gives Hamilton control over the financial system in return for Hamilton allowing the capital to move from New York to Washington, D.C. in the South. So those are the two songs that were up there. I did, gave a similar talk at, uh, at LSE and had the songs playing there. And they were live streaming. People were live tweeting as I was going. And on the Storify page, someone had tweeted, um, Central banking and rap battles, that's how we roll at the LSE. So I guess that's how you roll at Bruegel. Well. OK, <laughs> great. Thank you. So, so, so let me welcome, uh, welcome you, uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, to, to come and, and present today on lessons for the euro from early US monetary and financial history. Now, when I read the, the, the little booklet, and I hope all of you have secured, um, secured a copy, there were sort of three themes that I think really stood out and that sounded sort of familiar um, <laughs> uh, uh, when uh, having followed a bit the European debate in the last years. And I think that the, the first one is really about time. I think what, what you show is really that um, US fiscal history and the fiscal union was not finished when uh, the first secretary of the treasury, uh, uh, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, did what he did. In fact, it was only the beginning of a very long journey. I think the second point um, is really about the nature of the conflicts that happened over the subsequent years, which is really about bail-in versus bail-out, um, risk-sharing versus non-risk-sharing, um, bail-out of sub-federal debt or not, and so on. So a lot of themes that, that I think we, 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 we know very well. And the third one is really about uh, the importance of federal institutions. So the federal institutions, by pursuing a federal interest and legitimately pursuing that, they show actually that um, the sum is more uh, than, uh, than the components. Uh, the sum is more than, uh, than, uh, than an addition of, of the parts. So the federal policy actually in the end made sense for um, the federation as a whole. And I think these three themes that come out very strongly in this, in this book on US, um, uh, on US uh, history, uh, of course, are quite relevant also for the European debate where we talk about a bail-in, bail-out, where we talk about why is everything taking so long? Well, it's only eight years or 15 <laughs> years of monetary union. It took much longer in the US. And of course, uh, the central role of the European Central Bank, which is, of course, the federal institution that, that we have. Uh, on top of, of course, the European Commission, but the, the European Central Bank that, you know, does have the firepower and is doing a lot of policies that are very controversial, but that arguably uh, 
uh, uh, it is doing for uh, a general and, uh, and a federal interest, if, I may, uh, if, if one can define it in that way. So what we want to do uh, today, um, we want uh, to listen to your presentation, and afterwards um, we will uh, sort of have this new format sitting in these orange chairs. I've never <laughs> sit on them, actually. And, you know, debate a little bit among us, but also take questions from uh, and comments and, and really have a debate around this topic. So thanks again, Jeff, for writing the, the piece for us and for, for coming here and presenting. Well, thank you, Guntram. It's always a pleasure to be here um, and a, an opportunity to play a couple of songs from Hamilton. Uh, so I think Guntram has anticipated many of the themes that I want to talk about today. Europe, of course, is in the midst. No, that's good. One thing I can tell you, Guntram, though, is I don't have a watch, and there's no clock in this room, so I don't know if I'm going, you have to signal, start throwing things at me if I start going over time. So as you all know, Europe is in the midst of, I think, what is generally regarded as the gravest crisis in its history or in the history of the European Union, and uh, the question that is raised is whether further integration or even the current levels of integration in Europe are politically feasible. Often in talking about this, the United States is given as an example, a shining example of a successful monetary, fiscal, and financial union in which we, ha we confront correlated exogenous shocks and have automatic fiscal stabilizers and a banking union, and everything works wonderfully, and why couldn't we just do that? But I think, as Guntram has indicated, all of these things came together only after massive battles and a very, very long time. Depending on how you count, the U.S. didn't have a common currency. In fact, the U.S. didn't have a national currency until 1863, 80 years after the founding of the Republic. Right? And I'll go into detail about this as we go on. The U.S. didn't have an, a central bank, or its current central bank, until 1913, 130 years after the founding of the Republic. We didn't really have a fiscal union until the 1950s. The federal fiscal policies put in place in the 30s, they don't really kick in until the 1950s. And through most of American history, there were massive macroeconomic divergences among the regions of the country. There were uncoordinated state and regional level fiscal policies. There was highly fragmented bank regulation. And there was tremendous political conflict over what to do about all these things. So what I want to do is go back to the beginning, to the 1789, to the founding of the Republic, when the Constitution is adopted, and a band of young men set out to create a new country out of a disparate set of states whose economies were highly different from one another, had very little in common with one another, and the future of which was not at all clear, whether it was going to stay, to be, stay a country um, or turn into a bunch of smaller uh, sovereign states. Right? To point out how many of these problems were confronted and how there was movement towards some resolution. The central issue here as in Europe, or here in the United States, as in Europe today, is how to craft a union that can provide monetary, fiscal, and financial stability. Now, it might seem strange that that's a problem because everybody wants monetary, fiscal, and financial stability, but everybody may have different definitions of what constitutes monetary, fiscal, and financial stability. In the American context, the setup that I want to sort of start things off with and orient things with is to think of the U.S. at the time, and perhaps even today, as divided into two very broad groups in the population. Right? In the U.S., in the, the, the early 13 states, it's relatively easy to see as we'll go through. On the one hand, you have what we in the U.S. called the hard money forces, tight money forces. People in the established financial and commercial centers in the Northeast, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Boston, growing steadily, but these are areas that are established, they're industrializing, they're urban, they are creditor communities, that's where the banks and the investors are based, and they want what we might call responsible, conservative fiscal, monetary, and financial policies. And then you have the frontier. Again, think the United States is growing very rapidly in this period. Through much of the time, the frontier is advancing at the pace of a mile every two weeks. So the frontier is being pushed out a mile every two weeks. These are a very rapidly growing country, and there are regions that are growing very rapidly. And they want exactly the opposite. They want loose monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy. They want it to be easy to borrow. They want the financial 
and legal system to be favorable to debtors, not to creditors. They want fiscal policy to be extremely expansive because they need the infrastructure, the railroads, the canals, the roads, in order to allow the frontier to expand. So in a sense, what you've got is a country divided between those that want more, if you will, responsible or conservative monetary, fiscal, and financial policies on the one hand, and those that want looser, more expansionary monetary, fiscal, and financial policies on the other. The Northeast against the frontier. Um, now, there are obvious parallels with every country today, including Europe. Uh, Mark Twain is said to have, sa to have said, he's said to have said many things, but he's among them, he's said to have said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so in the spirit of uh, the Hamilton songs, I'm going to look for some of the rhymes today. So where do we start? We start with the United States in the midst of a war against Britain. Now, any Americans in the audience will know the expression worthless as a continental. The continental was the currency emitted by the Continental Congress, which was the, the legislature of the 13 colonies during the Revolution. And it was used to pay the uh, Continental Congress soldiers and suppliers and to pay off its debts. And it was, called, it was the term worthless as a continental came into being because it, the war was financed almost entirely by printing as many continentals as the, ooh, as the printing, uh, high-tech lectern here, as the, the printing presses could manage. So this shows the course, that you're going to get a better one, I know. This shows the course of the continental. So this is the, 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 the green line here is the specie value, that is the value of the continental currency in gold, and the blue line is the face value. It looks pretty good until you realize that this specie value is 10 times this, right? So when they cross, that means the continental is actually, one continental dollar is worth 10 cents in specie, that is in gold or silver. And by 1780 or so, a continental, one continental dollar is worth about a penny. Right. So there, there, this is where the term worthless as a continental comes from. So the first problem that Hamilton faced was how to establish a monetary system that functioned. During this period, by the way, continental currencies were essentially irrelevant. The money that circulated was foreign currencies, pounds sterling, Spanish trade dollars, Spanish trade dollars sometimes called pieces of eight. They were silver dollars that could be divided into eight parts, which is why Americans talk about two bits being two bits, being a quarter of a dollar. So there effectively was no national currency. Hamilton realized that having a national currency was essential, and he also realized that having a central bank was important to having a national currency. So this is Hamilton on one of the three major tracks that he wrote. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, as I was saying to Michelle before, was my hero. I grew up in New York. He's from New York. Um, he went to Columbia University when it was called King's College. I went to Columbia University. He's the founder of the country's financial system. And he started with three crucial tracks. The first called the report on the public credit, second the report on the national bank, and the third on the report on manufacturers. This is him from the report on manufacturers talking about central banking. He wrote famously in uh, a letter to Robert Morris that, uh, that a central bank is essential to the creation of a national currency, and a national currency is essential to the creation of a nation. So Hamilton believed firmly that the country needed a central bank, and after a great deal of conflict, mostly conflict against Thomas Jefferson, as in the song that was played, he won, and the Congress created the first bank of the United States in 1791. This is its building. It's in Philadelphia. The building's still standing. The Bank of the United States was a modern central bank in most senses. It was a bank patterned on the Bank of England, although it actually had greater powers than the Bank of England. It included note issue. It had incipient regulatory control. It acted as a lender of last resort in the panic of 1792. It implemented monetary policy. Now, there are lots of complex details as to how it carried out monetary policy in this period, and I can go into them if people are interested. But the, the basic point is that it was, a, it was a modern central bank that controlled, in one way or another, the country's monetary and financial position, and also had influence over the fiscal policies of the states. Right? It, for example, could keep banks in the various states from issuing too much currency, too many banknotes, by requiring them to be turned in for specie. So the, the bank had a variety of ways. I don't want to go into too much detail because I want to try to keep the talk as short as po possible. Um, but the bank had a variety of ways of keeping growth of the money supply relatively constrained. 
This is a national bank note issued by the first bank of the United States. It's for $10. Now, $10 is $250 in today's money, or perhaps more meaningfully, $10 in 1798 was about a month's salary for the average worker. So these notes were used in the interbank market. Right? So the way the first bank operated was by controlling the interbank market and therefore controlling the ability of banks to create money. It made it extremely controversial because what the first bank did was prohibit or limit the ability of banks on the periphery in the rapidly growing areas to extend loans. Right? So Hamilton's first bank turned out to be relatively, <coughs> relatively controversial in as much as it was restricting the ability of the rapidly growing areas to borrow as much as they wanted to. Okay? So that's on the monetary side. After dealing with monetary issues, Hamilton turned to fiscal issues. The fiscal problem that Hamilton faced was that the United States was completely unreliable as a creditor. It had no creditworthiness whatsoever. Uh, the reason it had no creditworthiness whatsoever is that its constituent uh, states, that is the, the states that made up the United States, were in default on virtually all of their obligations. I, mean, I let you read all this as we, as we go along. I don't want to read it to you. Right? So what Hamilton realized was that for the US, to be a functioning fiscal, financial, and, and monetary union, the federal authorities had to be credit worthy. It was not enough for one state to be able to borrow. New York could borrow. New York had paid its debts. New York was credit worthy. But the federal authorities, the central authorities, had to be credible. The federal authorities had to be able to access European financial markets to borrow from European investors or American domestic investors, and they couldn't. What he proposed was highly controversial again. The states, most of the states were in default. They owed hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars, which today would be hundreds of billions of dollars, to a variety of creditors. And they hadn't paid in 10 years, in some cases. Hamilton proposed that the federal government would take over all of these states' debts and start paying them off. Now, this is, again, an extraordinarily controversial scheme because what it meant was that the taxpayers, the federal taxpayers, were going to be asked to pay off the debts of states that had incurred those debts and that were not paying them. So people from New York, who had been paying their debts, were going to be asked to pay off the debts of Virginia, which was not paying its debts. This was called assumption in the American context because it involved the, the federal government assuming the debts of the several states. And Hamilton restructured these debts. You can see that around here, the debts are worth about 20 cents on the dollar. And as the restructuring grows, it's very, very complicated. Hamilton was a financial genius. He, he uh, uh, imposed substantial haircuts on the creditors. But he restructured the debts in such a way that within a year, the country's creditworthiness had been restored. And the US returns to the international capital markets right? with going from about 40 cents of the dollar to about 90 cents of the dollar returns to the capital markets by 1792, and the federal government is now regarded as creditworthy. So Hamilton solves the problems, but not so fast. Hamilton is only one of many figures, and Hamilton's supporters in the major commercial and financial centers gradually lose strength to the growing periphery. And in 1811, the periphery revolts, and uh, closes down the central bank. The central bank is what had operated monetary, financial, and fiscal policy. In the absence of the central bank, the country no longer has a national currency, has no control over note issue, and has no fiscal agent that is reliably uh, looked upon in international capital markets. Very poorly timed move in 1811 because, as some of you may know, a year later, the US embarked on a very poorly thought out war to try to take over Canada which we lost, uh, the War of 1812. And since we had no central bank, since we had no fiscal agent, and since the dechartering of the central bank had destroyed the country's credit worthiness, the US couldn't borrow to finance the war. It couldn't borrow internationally, and it couldn't borrow domestically, and instead had to finance it entirely by inflationary means. Right. So after the War of 1812 is over in 1815, Congress reconvenes and says, well, we made a mistake. Let's set up a central bank again. And they established the second bank of the United States. This is its building in Philadelphia. It looks a lot like the first bank. Um, the second bank actually was even more of a modern central bank than the first bank. 
And it was crucially important to the period of growth that began in the teens and into the 20s. This is the period of most rapid growth in pre-Civil pre War United States because it's after the invention of the cotton gin and it's after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. You know, during the Napoleonic Wars, the world economy was relatively closed. There wasn't very much for the U.S. to do internationally. But after 1815, the world economy starts opening. The U.S. starts growing much more rapidly. And so the Second Bank becomes a crucial agent in the context of this extraordinary economic growth in the United States from the 1820s through the Civil War. Again, the, the second bank, the, the new central bank, operates like a modern central bank. It restrains monetary policy or sets the monetary policy for the country as a whole. It act, exercises a sort of regulatory role in the state banks. It constrains what the state banks can do. It constrains what state governments can do in terms of issue, issuing their debt. Right? This is just, again, for completeness, uh, a bank note of the National Bank, right? a $5 bank note of the National Bank. So the second bank operates and serves to implement a relatively conservative monetary, fiscal, and financial policy. But again, this becomes politically extraordinarily controversial. And in the 1830s, one of the most important set of political conflicts in American history breaks out called the Bank Wars. War is over the second bank of the United States. This is a picture of um, Andrew Jackson, president at the time, who was from Tennessee on the frontier and who spent most of his presidency fighting against the Northeast and in particular against the second bank and its president, Nel Nicholas Biddle. This, the multi-headed hydra snake that, Alexander, that Andrew Jackson is fighting includes the Rothschilds and Bering Brothers and the Queen of England and Nicholas Biddle. It includes international financial markets who were seen as the enemies of the growth of the frontier and the bankers of New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore and the president of the second bank, the central bank. Right? What is Jackson's concern? What is Jackson's argument? Jackson's argument is the frontier doesn't need fiscal, financial, monetary restraint. It needs growth. It needs easy money. It needs easy lending terms. It needs pro-debtor policies. It needs more money, not less money. It needs more loans, not less, no, less loans. And it needs for the states to be able to borrow as much as they want. Instead of the central bank telling Mississippi or Georgia or Michigan, you can't borrow that because you can't support it through your banking system. Your bonds are not credit worthy. We're not gonna let, we're gonna take your bonds and try to redeem them for, for, for specie and that's gonna drive down their price and you're not gonna be able to emit them. Again, getting into the complications of how exactly the second bank worked. So the second bank restricted the note issue by banks on the frontier and restricted borrowing by the states. And Andrew Jackson said, this is artificially restraining the growth of the frontier. Right? Andrew Jackson attacks the central bank, and you can see. In, Andrew Jackson might be considered sort of one of the early American frontier populists, arguing that the bank was a tool of wealthy interests in the in the modern financial centers. Now, in retrospect, there are plenty of scholars who would say that there, wasn't, there was some truth to what Jackson was arguing. Again, the frontier is growing very, very rapidly. And in the final analysis, if there was a little bit of inflation, and if there was a little bit of overborrowing and overlending, and if there were some defaults and problems, in the final analysis, it led to very rapid growth and to the opening of the frontier. So I'm not making a normative argument as to who was right and who was wrong, but whatever, wherever the truth may lie and whatever might have been best for the country in the long run, there is no question that the country divided fundamentally over whether to adopt and accept the relatively conservative monetary, financial, and fiscal policies of the Second Bank or the attack on it by Andrew Jackson. Just for completeness again, this is Daniel Webster from Massachusetts defending the bank and defending the role of credit which the bank was trying to encourage, and credit worthiness in the uh, fomenting of economic and development in the United States. So this was a powerful battle between forces in favor of more responsible monetary and fiscal and financial policies on the one hand, and economic expansion and policies oriented towards, uh, towards encouraging indebtedness, encouraging indebtedness by the private sector, encouraging indebtedness by the banking sector, encouraging indebtedness by the states themselves in the interests of overall economic growth. Creditor interests in the Northeast, debtor interests on the frontier. In the event, the frontier was growing, 
The frontier was overweighted in, in the Senate. Jackson was from the frontier. The creditor interests lost. And in 1836, the second bank was closed down. And so we move into an, a new era in American monetary and financial history. Now, for those of you who think that all this is so far in the past that it doesn't matter, I will point out to you that the Tea Party and its supporters, including Donald Trump, have made Andrew Jackson their hero. And this is a quote, I will read this one from uh, the American Spectator. Who amongst past presidents should Republicans turn to for lessons and guidance? Who's the Tea Party progenitor? Who offers the inside outlook and rhetoric for today's GOP? The answer is Andrew Jackson, the great conservative populist of American history, and his story bears study. This is a Ron Paul poster. It, is, it includes a quote from Andrew Jackson in his uh, argument to close down the second bank, and it includes their slogan, which is end the Fed. So as, they, as was some, sometimes said about the bourbon, uh, the bourbons, uh, some in America um, have forgotten nothing and learned nothing. Uh, somewhat less, uh, uh, somewhat less sort of interest, or more interesting, more uh, nefarious is that there are, there are very fringe groups in the U.S. who see Andrew Jackson not only as the opponents of the New York bankers, but as the oppo opponents of the international Jewish conspiracy on the principle that, that Alexander Hamilton was a secret Jew and things like that. But the, the, you know, if you go online, you will easily come up with all sorts of Tea Party and Tea Party influenced uh, statements in which Andrew Jackson is the hero and Alexander Hamilton is the enemy. Alexander Hamilton and Nicholas Biddle are the enemy. So these issues remain current in American politics. The National Bank, the Second Bank is closed down, and what happens? Once the Second Bank is closed down, effectively, banking and monetary policy on the frontier is completely free, and the states are free to do whatever they want. Now, if you're in a more conservative state like New York or Massachusetts, then what you do is you remain, uh, you, you maintain relatively conservative fiscal, monetary, and financial policies. But if you're in Mississippi or Michigan or Indiana, one of these very rapidly growing frontier states, you let anybody who wants open a bank, and anybody who wants print banknotes. That is, banknotes that say they're worth a dollar. Those banknotes don't have to be backed by gold. What they have to be backed by usually is state bonds. So if you're in Mississippi, you say, we're going to borrow a lot of money, and we're going to sell those bonds to the banks, and the banks are going to use those bonds as capital against which they're going to issue banknotes. Now, the bonds may not get paid off, which means that maybe the banknotes are not going to get paid off, which means that those banknotes may not be worth a dollar on a dollar. But in any event, what happens here, as soon as the second bank is closed down, is there is, as you can see, a more than quadrupling in bank lending and more than doubling in the number of banks established. This is a period that's called free banking in the United States, where individual states can do whatever they want with their banking systems. And many of them, especially in the rapidly growing frontier, take advantage to engage in a very, very rapid expansion of both of banking and of monetary issue by the banks and of lending. Right? This is a banknote. So again, now, because the central bank no longer exists, there is no central currency. There is no national currency. The paper currency is issued by individual banks. Right? This is the, a dollar issued by the Bull's Head Bank. Right? Uh, bull's head on the, on the note. Each bank issued its own banknotes, and those banknotes were backed by the full faith and credit of the bank. Right? So what gave the banknote value was whatever the bank had in its reserves. Very quickly, came, people came to realize that banks in Mississippi probably didn't have the reserves necessary to back up they're all the banknotes they'd issued. So if a bank in Mississippi had issued $20 million, $20 million worth of banknotes, they might only have half a million dollars in reserves, which is nowhere near enough to support all the banknotes that have been issued. So people started saying, well, a banknote, a dollar from Mississippi is not worth the same thing as a dollar from New York. A dollar from Indiana is not the worth, worth the same thing as a dollar from Pennsylvania, because the banks in Indiana and, and Mich Michigan and Mississippi have very weak reserves, and they're not being regulated by their, by their states, and we don't rely on We don't trust them. So a new thing uh, er erupted, or the, a new publication developed called Banknote Reporters, so that every merchant in the country, every week, would get a banknote reporter, look like this or like this, and those banknote reporters would tell people, tell merchants, how much 
various dollars were worth. Now, you can't read this one. This is, is in detail. Um, this, this is uh, the, the listing of various states, and it tells you the discount that was applied to state dollars, right? So I just, I'll, I can read it here. So Indiana state dollars, Indi or dollars issued by banks in Indiana, were trading at a 10% discount. That is 90 cents on the dollar. Uh, Illinois dollars were trading at a 30% discount, 70 cents on the dollar. Tennessee, 10% on the dollar. Kentucky, 6%. And let's see, Louisiana, 50% discount, so 50 cents on the dollar. And then, very, then, then the, the reliable states, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, all trading at maybe one half of a percent discount, which is just a transaction cost, essentially a dollar on the dollar. Right? Um, very disconcertingly, when you look at Mississippi, it says no sale. So merchants would not accept dollars from the state of Mississippi because they were not backed by specie or any reserves, in part because the capital and reserves of these banks were held in state debt, there was a very close relationship between state borrowing and state banknotes and state monetary policy, right? Which I, I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but this is reminiscent of some of the things that have happened in, in the European Union since then. Okay, the, the states are borrowing very heavily, and I think it's worth pointing out that one of the reasons the states are borrowing as heavily as they are is that there is a memory of how 30, 40 years earlier, the federal government had bailed out the states that had gotten in trouble. So there is market commentary in the 1830s saying, well, it's true we know that Mississippi is never really going to pay back its debts. That's why its banknotes are worth nothing. But if they do, in fact, default, which they will eventually, the feds will bail them out. So there was an expectation of a bailout. In other words, and this gets to some of the contradictoriness of creation of a monetary and fiscal and financial union, Hamilton's undoubtedly correct move of establishing the creditworthiness of the central government and its authoritative ability and willingness to stand behind state debts created moral hazard and the incentive for the states to borrow more than they, in fact, could manage to pay back. So what happens over the course of the 1830s is that the more conservative states managed their finances quite conservatively, and the more expansionary and less conservative, more, uh, more of the frontier states borrow way more than they can pay back. And eventually, after the crisis of 1841 hits, a panic ensues, default on their debts. As you can see, this is, these, these, this is simply picking up uh, state debt as a share of state income. These states either defaulted or repudiated their debts, and on average, they have a level of debt which is about four times on a per capita basis, that of the more conservative states. Eight states and one territory default on their debts in the 18, 18, late 1830s, early 1840s primarily, expecting, fully expecting that they will be bailed out by the federal government. The markets react, and of course, the yields go to you know, astronomical 40%. Um, in, in the early 1840s, and everybody sits back and waits for the feds to step in and bail out the banks. And a massive conflict ensues in Congress in which the eight states that are in default argue for a federal bailout, and the 15 or so states that are not in default say, why? We're not in default. Why should our taxpayers pay for you? We did it once. It doesn't mean we're going to have to do it again. And in fact, there is no bailout. The states that are in default remain in default. Some of them are still in default. This is Mississippi. State of Mississippi defaulted on a whole series of bonds issued in 18, the 1830s, um, one for 1.9 million, another for 5 million. This is uh, from the annual report of the Council of Foreign uh, Bondholders in London, which is an organization that brings together all the bondholders that hold foreign bonds in London, and issues an annual report, and it reports on its negotiations with, with countries or sovereigns that are in default on their debt. This is the report on its negotiations with uh, the state of Mississippi, and every year the annual report of the Council of Foreign Bondholders has indicated, and I think I, I can write it here, so the council wrote in February 1952, to the governor-elect inviting him to give his earnest consideration to this default, they pointed out the injustice which was perpetrated so long ago and invited the governor to appoint a representative to discuss with them the best practical measure of settling the matter in a credible and satisfactory way. The governor did not respond to the suggestion. 
The governor cannot respond to the suggestion because the state of Mississippi, after defaulting, uh, dissolved the state legislature, held a constitutional convention, and adopted a new constitution, which includes as one of its articles the prohibition that any official of the state of Mississippi have any contact with the creditors of these bonds. <laughs> right? So it's actually unconstitutional under Mississippi law to negotiate these bonds. Now, I, the accrued interest must be in the trillions of dollars, but if anybody ever asks you what's the world's biggest defaulter, I think you now know it's the state of Mississippi. Right? Not Argentina, not Russia, not Greece, state of Mississippi. Okay, in any event, the point here is that these debts were not uh, were defaulted on. They were not recognized by the federal government. Taking things forward a little bit, what's the, what's the response of the states to that? The states, recognizing that they are not going to be bailed out, impose quite stringent fiscal requirements on themselves. Some of them adopt balanced budget amendments of various forms of stringency. Others adopt fiscal institutions like independent audit, auditing boards to try to ensure that they will be able to service their debts. Now, they don't do this out of the kindness of their hearts. They do this because they want access to the capital markets. They recognize that if the feds aren't going to bail them out, if they're on their own hook, they're only going to be able to borrow if they're borrowing is credit worthy. And so the states, including Mississippi, say, let's wipe the slate clean, and we are now going to prove to you that we are credit worthy by setting up a balanced budget amendment, an auditing board, more responsible fiscal policy. So we have here, in a sense, the two moments of establishing a fiscal union. The one where the central authority establishes its willingness and ability to act authoritatively to deal with financial and fiscal problems that the union as a whole is confronting. And then, the moral hazard being created, the second moment in which the federal authorities respond by saying we are not responsible for every action of every subnational unit, every sovereign, the states are sovereign within the US, every sovereign unit that makes up this federal authority, you are on your own with respect to your own borrowing. All of these conflicts are eventually resolved, as so many other conflicts in the US are, with the Civil War. I've mentioned that this is largely about the urban industrial northeast against the expanding frontier. The most important component part of that frontier is in the south, the slave south, slave-owning south. Like the tariff, monetary and financial policy was something that split the northeast from the south. And like the tariff, conflicts continued until the south was no longer part of the union. Um, I tell my students that from the 1820s until the 1850s, Congress battled continually over the tariff. When the southern states left the Union, what that meant was that the southern congressmen and, and senators are no longer in the Congress, right? So they're, they're, they're not sitting in the, on the floor of the House and Senate. The first act of the new House and Senate is to declare the southern states to be in secession. Its second act is to raise the tariff, right? which it hadn't been able to do because the South had blocked any increase in the tariff. And one of the other acts that it carried out was the National Banking Act of, 18, of 1863, which established an income tax, which the South had blocked, established a national treasury and a national currency, the greenback, which the South had blocked, and enabled the national treasury to un undertake what we might think of as monetar modern monetary and fiscal policy. Right? So the modern currency, monetary, financial union of the United States dates to 1863. And it was only possible because the southern states were no longer in the mix, no longer able to affect policy making. Right? So that's where the story ends to a certain extent. I could carry it forward to 1913 because it's not till 1913 that we get a central bank, and it's not till the 1930s, 40s, 50s that we get fiscal stabilizers. But let me stop with the American examples and try to draw out some of the lessons for, uh, for Europe and more broadly. The first lesson, I think, is a very simple one. It's one that, you know, to, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, it is that in monetary, fiscal, financial policy, as in economic policy almost always, you can't satisfy all the people all of the time. There are always going to be different definitions of what the appropriate monetary and financial policies are. There are always going to be conflicts of interest over monetary policy. Monetary policy is not, despite what some think, a purely technical issue, 
There is no way of making monetary policy apolitical. I, I uh, don't want to offend anyone, but there are, I know that there are people who believe that it is possible to take monetary policy out of the realm of politics. It is not policy, possible. Monetary policy is made by institutions created by politicians and will always be responsive in one way or another to the political realities of the society it faces. This is just as true today as it was in the early 19th century. So monetary policy is political, and I think it behooves us to think about the kinds of interests that are at stake in the making of monetary policy, and what kinds of political pressures monetary policy makers face as they think about this. On fiscal and financial policy, again, policy towards debt and adjustment is highly political. We talk often about the asymmetry of the adjustment burden. We talk about, in the context of a debt crisis, whether it's the cr debt crisis of the US states, or the debt crisis of Argentina, or the debt crisis of Puerto Rico today, or the debt crisis in the Eurozone today, we talk about how the burden of adjustment will be distributed. That is the fundamental political issue that faces all countries or, in, or unions in which uh, debts have become unsustainable. Will it be creditors that take the hit? Will it be debtors that take the hit? Within creditor countries, who is going to bear the burden of adjustment? So both monetary and fiscal and financial policy are highly political. I don't want to belabor the historical analogies because uh, I think it's clear that that in the US, in the EU, there are certainly divergences over the desirable monetary and fiscal and financial policies. And the same is true over adjustment policy as well. But I do want to try to make um, two broader related points. The first is that designing monetary policy for a disparate union, like the United States or the Eurozone, will always be political. There is unlikely to be one optimal policy for any seriously large economic union. And no amount of rule writing is gonna change that. You can't write rules that are going to eliminate the politicization or the political uh, controversies over monetary policy. The challenge for observers, I think, is to understand what the pressures are on these monetary authorities and how they respond to those pressures. The second broader point is that debt is always political and recovery from a debt crisis is especially so. There, was, there will always be conflicts between debtors and creditors. There will always be conflicts within debtor countries and within creditor countries. The final point that I want to make has to do with the creation of a union itself because it implicates a very complex issue that the founders, the American founders faced, and that I think you and the European Union face. The balance between central and decentralized authority and responsibility for financial and fiscal policy in particular. Let me point out, as I've, if I've tried to illustrate, that the US did two things over the course of a 50 or 60 year period. First, it established the credibility of its central authorities with a comprehensive debt restructuring. So it established that it had a federal government capable of carrying out an authoritative restructuring of its finances. That was the first thing. That first thing was crucially important to the US, but it also created moral hazard. So the second thing the US did 50 years later was that it tamped down that moral hazard by not bailing out the states that had gotten themselves into difficulty. And I think this highlights a central problem or trade-off in any kind of federal union. I, I, I use the word federal advisedly, any kind of union at all. Right? That is, any, anything that brings together a group of states to do something collectively. Because in any kind of union of that, site, of that type, it's crucial for the central authorities to establish their willingness and ability to resolve problems that national governments can't resolve on their own. Otherwise, why would you have a union? Right? If the central authorities can't do anything that national governments can do on their own, then you don't need the central authorities. So it's crucial, I think, it was, it was crucial for Hamilton to prove that the federal government could do something that the individual states were incapable of doing on their own. And the analogies to the European Union, I think, are, are obvious. I don't think the American example is gospel, but I would submit that unless the European Union, and by the European Union I mean the member states acting collectively and the institutions of the European Union themselves, if unless the European Union can act collectively in order to resolve the current crisis, however you want to define the crisis, a crisis of indebtedness, a crisis of the financial system, a crisis of monetary policy, unless the member states and the institutions of the EU can resolve the current crisis, 
it will be difficult for people to believe that it can confront other regional problems in any way other than uh, congeries of independent nation states. Right? However, if it does effectively respond to the crisis at a central level, it will create moral hazard, and then we'll have to deal with that moral hazard. Right? So, conclusions from the American experience, very simply, crafting a union is a long, hard road. It's difficult, not, not due to technical reasons. That is, there are plenty of technical solutions to the problems that, that I've been talking about. Um, the real problem, the real core of the difficulties that the American Union faced, and I think that the European Union faces, are the need to find a politically sustainable compromise between the legitimate concerns of the subunits, whether they're states or nation states, and the broader entity, the Federal Union in the case of the United States, the European Union in the case of the European Union. It took the United States an extremely long time and, unfortunately, a civil war to resolve that issue of how responsibilities would be ascribed to, carried out by the central state authorities or by the sovereign states that made it up. And I would submit that the current economic and social and political turmoil, even in the United States, indicates that that compromise may not be entirely stable. So despite the fact that we did work out many of the aspects of our monetary, financial, and fiscal union, they are still hotly contested. It's taken us 200 years to get to where we are today. And so I think it's no surprise that for the European Union and the Eurozone, the concluding chapter of this story is nowhere close to being written. So let me stop there, and we can go back to Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. This was, I think, a uh, very passionate and very interesting uh, description of the U.S. history and some, I think, some, some valuable lesson for um, the current situation in Europe. Now, I think before I open the, the, the floor, let me, let me sort of quiz you on one or, one or two, two, two points. I mean, I, I think the first point I, I really found quite interesting was the remark right at the end where you said, well, perhaps the issues are still not fully settled in the U.S., so the, the, the debate continues, yes. um, and uh, coming from, uh, from a federal country, uh, namely Germany, I can assure you that um, uh, in Germany there's a constant debate about um, uh, fiscal federalism and how to reassign uh, 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 resources from the federal to the, uh, to, to the local level. So, so um, are you basically saying these political conflicts, I mean, they, they are there anyway, and they, they, they will continue to be there, including in the U.S.? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's what I meant when I said, I, you know, as a sort of throwaway line, <clears throat> that you can't satisfy all the people all the time. No one monetary policy is going to be equally, going to be good for everyone. I mean, think of what's happening in the U.S. today, and I think we have fairly similar uh, uh, concerns expressed in, in Europe. But the American setting is one where we have extremely loose monetary policy, as you know, effectively zero interest rates. Now, as I think I was saying to you or some others earlier, I give public talks to a variety of groups in the U.S. about what's going on in economic policy. The attendance at those groups is very heavily weighted towards retirees, because who else has time to go to those kinds of talks? And I can tell you that the most common comment, really not comment, but the most common complaint from retirees is, how can they expect us to live with these low interest rates? Right? Um, because I retirees- I can assure you I got that comment also quite I'm a sure, number of times sure in yeah, my I've home. I've gotten home. the comment myself in Germany. Um, it, because retirees as savers depend on the earnings on their retirement savings to be able, in the US especially, because most people are depending on private retirement savings. People, these are people who have gotten used to earning seven, eight, nine percent a year on their savings and are now lucky to earn one percent, if anything. Right? Now, my honest answer would be, well, think of the good of the country. The country needs loose monetary policy. Zero interest rates is good for the country. There are always going to be winners and losers, and guess what? You're the losers. Um, not a popular answer. I gave it once. It didn't work too well, so I tried not to give it again. Um, but the reality is that any monetary policy that you choose is going to dissatisfy some. Now, in the, now we have actually, in Europe, of course, a lot of this takes a regional form where the monetary policy that's appropriate for Spain is not appropriate for Germany. Or, but even within countries, it, there, there are differences in, in appropriateness. The U.S., I mean, an example that's often given in the U.S. is regional, right? 
where you might say the oil patch, like uh, this, this has actually been a very significant issue in the US over the course of the last 30 years. Um, Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana, which are big oil states, run counter cyclically to the country. That is, when oil prices are high, they're booming, and the rest of the country is in recession. And when oil prices are low, they're in recession, and the rest of the country is booming. So what you'd really want is a Texas dollar that could depreciate when the oil price goes down and appreciate when the oil price goes up. But Texas is subjected to the monetary policy of the country. And so when the, so the Fed is extremely unpopular in Texas because it's always pursuing the wrong monetary policy. Right? Right. Um, so, so perhaps the second question, and then I, let, let me open. I mean, the second question is really about the growth of the frontier, uh, mm -hmm. which um, I think you very vividly uh, described, you know, the frontier moving one mile every, every two weeks, mm -hmm. leaving lots of funding for infrastructure, leaving lots of funding for buildings, for schools, for, you know, for basically for everything, for everything. because uh, right. it was moving into, into the prairie, basically, right. so into, into, the, into the wild uh, in, in many respects. Now, if you take that analogy, where I clearly see the need for easy monetary, easy fiscal policies, to the European Union, I mean, it's not exactly that we have a frontier that is moving. Um, now, arguably, there has been a period of catching up growth, right. where um, uh, uh, you know uh, some countries in southern Europe have used um, the the capital that was inflowing um, productively and you know basically advanced the productivity frontier and. You know, use that that resources, but are we at a state now where you would say, well, <coughs> we're still gonna gonna have another 20, 30 uh, years of real serious growth, or have we come to a limit where the growth model is actually, even if you had much much mm -hmm. higher, uh, you know, uh, basically funding, uh, where, where the growth model has come to an end because. We have good infrastructure. You go to Portugal, you go to Spain, uh, you, you see better air, airports and better mm -hmm. railways than, uh, than in many, many parts in no, 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 northern, northern Europe. Right. Perhaps the, the obstacles are of a different sort now. Yeah. So, so, so is, it, is it really a comparison that can be made? Here? Well, I think there, there are two points to be made. The first is that I think there are still substantial divergences within the European Union. Now, if we're talking about the core of the Eurozone, then it's a little bit different. But if you include, as I think we should, the European Union more generally, think of Central and Eastern Europe. Right. And, and so there, I think, we, we, we have a convergence club and the issues that are, again, I don't want to overdraw these comparisons, but they're analogous to the issues associated with the frontier. It's quite clear that countries like Poland, to take an example, right. And, and others in Central and Eastern Europe are sh both are going to grow faster, we, we, we hope they would grow faster than the core of Europe, and they are growing faster in most instances. That means that their monetary, both their monetary conditions, both that their monetary conditions should be different, yeah. and to a large extent that they are different. I mean, yeah. there's a reason why Poland didn't join the Euro, and there's also a reason why it was probably right for them to depreciate the Zwati by 40% and continue growing all through the crisis. Right. So there is a region, or there are regions in the European Union that are still well behind and need to catch up, and that, from a normative standpoint, would require a very different monetary stance than that of, say, Denmark or, or Germany or even perhaps of Spain. So that's the, the first point. The second point is within the core of the Eurozone, and I guess I, I would include in the core countries like Spain and Italy, uh, not just the northern European countries, um, the question you ask is really, what are the limits to growth? And what role does monetary policy play in either encouraging or discouraging or having some impact on growth? <clears throat> and I would say that up until now, the Eurozone, like the United States, has relied very heavily <clears throat> sorry, on monetary policy as its principal tool of macroeconomic policy. And that may have been necessary economically and politically, because effectively no other tools were available. Mm -hmm. But running macroeconomic policy by solely with use of monetary policy is not a stable long-run policy uh, prescription. Especially um, with interest rates. Especially with interest rates at, at, at where they are, right? Negative <coughs> here. Yeah. Um, so I think the we don't know, there is a big debate going on, as many of you know, over secular stagnation. We don't know whether the limits to growth currently are being constrained by productivity, by technological advances, by demographic factors. But one thing we do know, which is that 
the tools of macroeconomic policy have not been used in Europe and North America over the last 10 years. But specifically, fiscal policy, and I don't want to engage in these broad debates over what the appropriate fiscal policy is. Whatever you think the appropriate fiscal policy may be, it is clear that fiscal policy has been tightly constrained by the politics of fiscal policy, both in the US and in the European Union. To give you an American example, Larry Summers has been going around for the last three years saying the US should be borrowing every penny it can to build schools and highways and infrastructure. Why shouldn't we borrow? Because people are basically giving us money. Why shouldn't we borrow at zero interest rates and use it to increase the productive capacity of the country? And it's a very important question to ask. Now, whatever your answer may be, the point is that fiscal policy has been, for political reasons, off the table. And I think that's a mistake. I think that's, that's, it's a, that is a gap in the pos policy possibilities available to European and North American policymakers. OK, let me uh, uh, collect questions. There's a question there in the back. Um, so I will collect three in a okay. row, I would say. If, then if I better take okay notes. Uh, so the gentleman in the back, then you. And then Hi. Um, thank you for your in interesting lesson. <clears throat> I want to go back to the reasons for the central bank. Um, so you explained how it's necessary for the funding of the state, how it's necessary to go to war, and why it's necessary for the um, for Wall Street, basically. <laughs> but what is, why is it good for Main Street, and why is it necessary for the economy to have a central bank? Because you rather easily dismissed the end of Fed argument from uh, Dr. Paul, but I think he's a specialist in uh, monetary policy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a, yeah, please. Bernard Segol, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting um, presentation. I have two questions. I'm allowed to have one, so you can <laughs> pick up which one you want, or both. No, you're me. allowed for two. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the end, you made it in the US. You have one dollar, which is valuable both in, in the South and in the North. And the question is, if you made it, in your opinion, is it essentially because you had more uh, cultural uh, links between the various states, or is it because of the economic needs um, that were more convergent? And my second question is that I haven't quite understood. Um, you were speaking of the countries of the Northeast and frontier. What is the frontier? I mean, are they the countries which are not northeast? I mean, that's more technical. I, I didn't so get it really. It's Mississippi or yeah. yeah. I, so I mean, it can be. I can. I can. Okay. I can answer so both. then, then Francesco. Um. Well, thank you very much. Um, in uh, your uh, story about the United States, New York versus uh, the Wild West. <laughs> uh, I mean, the difference was of interest. I mean, different interest. So different basic fundamental reasons to disagree. And from your answer to Guntram's question, I think you tend to have the same uh, interpretation about Europe. It's, it's interest. Um, what is the role of cultural factors, uh, different views about how the economy works? Uh, I think that in Europe, I mean, if you look at Germany and Italy, they think that the economy work in a different way. Uh, so it's not only interest, I think, and, and this makes uh, the, the problem a bit uh, different. I don't know whether easier or more difficult to deal with, uh, but you don't have to look at just interest. I'm not sure that the interest of Germany is to have the policy they have, and I'm not sure that it's the interest of Italy to have the policy they, they, they have. Um, so, isn't there something, again, cultural, something having to do with the understanding of how the economy works? I think it's a very, a very good question, and if I may, I mean, you, you, you may have seen that uh, Markus Gronemeyer is, is going to come out with a, with a book, um, The Euro Crisis, The Battle of Ideas, right. uh, which, you know, takes sort of, I don't know whether it's cultural, but at least the view that um, the, the different policy results that we are seeing are not a result of uh, primarily of different interests, but rather of um, uh, different um, intellectual traditions. Perhaps it's intellectual um, uh, uh, views of how the economy functions. So 
Okay, um, so the first question was about why we might need central banking uh, or a central bank. The, the counter argument is, uh, which Ron Paul and others would give, and, and some others would give, is that we don't need any government issue of currency. As long as that currency could be issued freely by private banks Bitcoin. and, right? Bitcoin. Bit, well, Bitcoin or, you know, the free, free banking uh, could work that, you know, if people don't trust the currency of a particular bank, they discount it and so on and so forth. Uh, there's no country in the world that's, that's tried that lately um, and probably never will be. The general conclusion of virtually all monetary economists, and I'm simply summarizing here and I don't think uh, any monetary economist present would disagree, is that monetary stability and a, a national currency are public goods that they are non-excludable and non-rivaling consumption and that they need to be provided by the public sector, by the public. That then leaves the question of who ensures the, that the national currency is valuable. That is, that it's not going to lose value uh, because the government takes advantage of its monopoly over currency issue to deflate it. The, the role of the central bank, presumably, at least in this context, is to try to ensure that this generally desirable uh, thing, public good, a national currency, is reliable, is stable, that it's not going to lose value, that the government's not going to inflate it in order to expropriate the people who are holding the currency. So the argument for, for, for modern central banking is the argument for national currencies. You can't have a national currency without a, an institution that's in, in charge of supervising it. That is something that Hamilton recognized. That is something that the Bank of England recognized. That is something that all central banks, going back to the 16th and 17th century, recognized, and it's part of modern central banking. But that's a, perhaps a more philosophical discussion, if, and which I'm happy to carry out, but it doesn't have too much to do with the current issues with the ECB or the, or, or the Fed, because I don't think there are too many people who think that the Fed should be closed down. Um, when the audit of the Fed movement, by the way, is mostly about trying to get the Fed to pursue the policy that, they, that people want it to pursue, not to close it down. Right. Um, so, the, the, uh, the issue about the U.S. making it first is definitionally the frontier, well, of course, since the frontier was moving out all the time, um, the frontier, in some cases, at, at the beginning, the frontier was Georgia and western Pennsylvania, but by the 1830s and 40s, it had moved towards the Mississippi. So, the frontier states in the 1830s were places like Indiana and Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama, we had not reached the, the Mississippi River yet, right? The, the, the front, if you want a specific geographic determination, the Appalachian Mountains, which were about 200 miles inland, the country before 1800, the country was almost entirely on the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountains, and the frontier is passing the Appalachians going into western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, so that's the frontier. It's not the prairies. I mean, the, the Great Plains and the prairies weren't right, open until the 1870s and 1880s, right? right? Um, which, which then led to a whole new round of monetary battles over monetary policy with the populists and the greenback movements over, over the Great Plains. Uh, the, the role of, of cultural links or economic needs, in a sense, these are two sides of the same coin. You were asking about the cultural links and you were asking about different cultural views or cultural factors. I will state my view, which is that I'm sure that cultural and ideational or ideological factors matter but I'm always struck at how much you can do in explaining these things by looking solely at, at interests, at the role of interests. Um, it's not particularly complicated to me to understand why it is that the creditor countries in Europe would like to be paid back by the debtors, while the debtor countries would like to have their debts restructured. That doesn't strike me as a particularly cultural argument. It may be that Italians culturally believe that debts shouldn't be paid back, while Germans culturally believe that debts should be paid back. But it can't be a coincidence that it's the Germans that are owed the money and it's the Italians that are owing them. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that these cultural factors matter to some extent. But I also but for, think for that... For Italy, it's not quite true. No? I so, know. so Italy, the debt is held mostly domestically. I know, so I know. Well, actually, general. actually, the Italians believe very firmly that that should be paid back because they're paying it back to themselves, right? Exactly, I think so. so. <laughs> right. But I, I was, it was for effect, right. no, Trump. No, no, sure. Right, Sorry. So, <laughs> But the, the, the same thing is true, I think, about the issue of how seriously uh, people take issues like low inflation, monetary stability. Monetary stability is, is an, interesting, an interesting phrase, right? 
Monetary stability today should mean keeping prices high, that is keeping them from deflating, as was true in the late 19th century. In the late 19th century, the people who argued for monetary stability were the inflationists, the populists, because we were in a period of long deflation. In the 1980s and 90s, monetary stability meant deflation or disinflation. Today, the argument for monetary stability is largely an argument for avoiding deflation. Right? So to say that, you're, that Germans want monetary stability culturally flies in the face of the fact that today what they're arguing for is something that's not monetary stability. It's deflation. Right? So I, I'm, I personally find the interest-based arguments pretty compelling, but I certainly wouldn't deny the fact that these cultural factors matter. One aspect that I think where I think cultural factors, social solidarity, societal factors do matter a lot is in thinking about the distribution of costs associated with crises of this type. So here in the United States, we had a borrowing boom, a housing bubble, a financial crisis, and we bailed out the banks. In Europe, you had a borrowing boom, a housing bubble, a financial crisis, and you bailed out the banks. In the US, it would, could easily have been the case that people in Massachusetts and New York said, why should we be, be spending our money to bail out those lazy people in South Florida and Arizona and California and Texas who borrowed so stupidly? But we didn't. Instead, it was, this is the United States. If, if there is a financial problem in South Florida, it's going to affect the country as a whole. There's a sense of social solidarity, as you might say, that means that these regional distinctions in the US aren't as important as they were in the 1830s. Right? So the fact that in Europe, it did largely become an issue of Germans blaming Spaniards or Dutch, the Dutch blaming Greeks, even though the underlying economic reality of both the borrowing boom and the financial crisis was very, very similar, has something to do with the cultural distinctions among the peoples of Europe. Or the fact that Americans think of themselves as Americans first, and Texans or Floridians or New Yorkers second. So can I push you on that point a sure. little bit more? Because uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, th I think uh, I, I mean, I think you're a little bit too rosy in your description of the U.S. Uh, I mean, yeah. where, where, where we have, and we talked about this yesterday, I mean, where, where we certainly have, uh, uh, you know, uh, rich people, very rich people that have not really been affected by, by this crisis and that have, you know, felt quite reluctant to actually put in place something that, that actually helps, uh, 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 is including people from different cultural and ethnic background minorities and so on. So, so perhaps it's less a geographical right. struggle, but it, they, there's a class struggle certainly exactly ongoing. Exactly right. No, you're exactly right. I mean, the, 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 sec the corollary to that is that the regional distinctions in the U.S. have faded dramatically, and it's ironic. I mean, we think of the U.S. Americans or scholars typically think of Europe being a class-ridden society or class-ridden societies and the U.S. not, but the divisions in the U.S. are much more class than they are regional, while in Europe they seem to be much more regional than they are class. Very ironic. Because you're absolutely right. Whether it was during the crisis, over the stimulus, today over fiscal and monetary policy, uh, over the, the current rise of populism of both the left and the right, these are not regional issues. These don't divide New York from Texas. These divide upper middle class, rich, lower middle class, working class. It's really uh, an, an economic divide in the US today. That's, that's, but but that's, not, that's not really cultural. That's why well, I was sure. addressing yeah, it sure. as being sort of not a cultural issue in the US. Sure, totally, I agree. Let, let me let no no no. Let me collect a little bit more. So uh, Marek, uh, Maria, Gregory. Uh, oh no, sorry, you and then Gregory. Uh, uh, Marek, please. Okay, Marek Dombrowski. I have two questions. One, um, whether there were any federal bailouts uh, of states after Hamilton and before 1840. Uh, and uh, second, you. Your thesis is that monetary policy uh, has been always uh, politicized. Whether this also relies to the period of gold standard in US, or uh, maybe gold standard decrease a bit level of politicization. Uh, okay, that's an easy one. Should I, should I answer it first? Or do you want to no, take let's more? let's let's take four. So so the gentleman uh, here in in the or oh, Maria first, okay, and then 
I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what uh, the second question of Malik was on the political nature of monetary policy. What do you mean by that? Do you mean that monetary policy is just part of broader economic <coughs> policy and therefore is as political as any other uh, policy decision that we make? Or do you mean that we should go back in the statutes of central banks and uh, change words like independence um, or uh, take away uh, things, uh, that their, their ability to how they finance themselves, the financing models, mm -hmm. Uh, or get rid of all the models that we use in forming this monetary policy. Please, Nils. Thank you, Lars Orgold, formerly with the Commission. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, two questions are a little bit related. Optimum currency area, one currency. Uh, is the U.S. an optimum currency area? If not, uh, how do you solve that? And if you talk about the Eurozone, I don't think we are. A, an optimum currency area, and for that you need some kind of adjustments by way of capital transfers or fiscal transfers, uh, fiscal union and all the rest. And related to that, could you comment on the current kind of setup that we have in the uh, monetary union in the EU with relation to the bias as I see it towards the creditor nations uh, and therefore as in your peril, you're having a, a, an EU situation where it's the, the East in the US versus the growth oriented in the, uh, the West. Thank you. Uh, and I take the last, Gregory. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm Gregory Kless from Bruegel. Uh, I have a question because you, you talked a lot about um, monetary policy and also fiscal policy, but you talk only about one side of fiscal policy, mostly expenditure. Uh, but you didn't discuss um, a lot about the fiscal union was created in terms of taxes, in terms of uh, uh, grabbing uh, tax, taxing power. And I was wondering if uh, this taxing, uh, this, uh, the grabbing of taxing power uh, took place uh, when Hamilton decided to, uh, to, to bail out the state. Was it the moment where uh, the Congress was given uh, the right to tax or, or was it later? Because you also mentioned that uh, income taxes only were created uh, during the Civil War. So I was wondering because <coughs> It's an obvious parallel to Europe that uh, uh, the central uh, or the federal level has uh, no taxing power and a very small budget. So I was wondering what, what's, your, what's, your, uh, what's the U.S. Uh, story about that? And, and perhaps we can extend that question. I mean, there's the taxing power in the U.S. which was related to tariffs. Um, but in, on the European side, the question goes beyond taxing power. It's also about shifting of uh, taxing power from the, fe from the national to the federal level because the states are already so big at the national level, right? That's right. So, That's right. Um, okay. Please. Uh, no, there were no bailouts before the 1840s. And the reason is simple, that while the second bank was in operation, it constrained the state's borrowing, right? It, I don't want to get into the details of how it did it, but we, we can talk about that afterwards. So the states were not able to borrow <coughs> above their ability to repay until the second bank was closed up. It was closed up in 1836, then they started borrowing heavily. Six years later, they fell into crisis. So that's why there, there were no bailouts before then. Monetary policy was, you said, w the question was, was monetary policy depoliticized under the gold standard? Quite the opposite. The gold standard was probably the most politically controversial issue in American politics from the 1860s until the 1930s. It was the most, the central economic policy issue in the US from the 1860s onward. Um, at least five presidential elections were fought over the gold standard. First, between 1865 and 1879, as to whether we should go back to gold. We went off gold during the Civil War, whether we should go back to gold during the, the so-called greenback period. And then in the 1880s and 90s, there was the populist movement that argued that the US should go off the gold standard and onto a depreciated silver standard, which probably would have been, which undoubtedly would have been the right thing to do. It's certainly what Milton Friedman thought we should have done. The gold standard was a terrible mistake for the US as a commodity producer, and we should not have gone back to gold, and we should not have stayed on gold, in my enormous opinion. But whether my opinion doesn't matter, the reality is that the politics of gold were incredibly controversial. Right? William Jennings Bryan, the most famous speech in American political history was William Jennings Bryan nomination speech at, at the Democratic National Convention of 1896, in which he said famously, Thou shalt not thrust down upon the, the crown, the, the, the crown, thou shalt not thrust, thrust down this crown of thorns upon the suffering brow of mankind. Thou shalt not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. It's the so-called cross of gold speech, right? Um, and it was a massive 
political movement which, which did not win under Bryan, but it was highly politicized. Um, so the question about the reality of monetary policy, well, these questions are, are interrelated. I, my point is not that we should, that somehow we should revise the statutes of central banks. My point is that thinking that monetary policy can somehow be technically removed from the political arena is mm. a pipe dream. Central banks are created by governments. I mean, I, I'll talk about the Fed. The Fed is, is, a cre is a creature of Congress. Congress could shut the Fed down tomorrow if it wanted to. Lee Hamilton used to say that whenever the Fed chair would come to, to testify before Congress, he would make sure that there were half a dozen bills in the hopper eliminating the independence of the Fed, just as a threat, to keep him honest. Right? And the reality is that some of my best friends are central bankers. Um, the reality is the central bankers are well aware that they operate in a highly political environment. And I think the ECB has been exemplary in trying to respond to the underlying political realities of the European Union, of the, of the Eurozone. So to think that, the, that central banks, that a statute can somehow remove any political institution from political pressures is a pipe dream. Now, it's a pipe dream that seems to be popular in certain parts of Europe, but it's a pipe dream. It's not supported by theory, and it's not supported by evidence. And it makes a lot more sense to, to, to simply accept that monetary policy is going to be made in a highly politicized environment, and that it's going to have to try to address the concerns of very disparate groups in the population than to pretend that there is one appropriate monetary policy, and if only we knew it, we could implement it. That's, so it, it's a recognition of reality. That, that I would argue for. Um, the US is not an optimal currency area. There have been lots of studies of this, uh, despite having had a single currency for 100 and whatever it is, 50 years, um, by the normal standards. It's not an optimal currency area, which may tell us something about how useful the, the, the concept of optimal currency area is. Canada is not an optimal currency area. Australia is not an optimal currency area. Um, I think that, that the, the general conclusion would be that the fact that it's not an optimal currency area hasn't hurt because there are a variety of other economic policy levers at the disposal of the states and of the federal government. Now, I'm going to say something controversial. Um, and if Paul de Grave were here, he would, he would immediately jump up, as he has in previous circumstances. The, way, the reason the monetary union works in the US is not, despite what people keep saying, is not federal fiscal stabilizers. Mm. The federal fiscal stabilizers play a trivial role yes. in dealing with the differences among the states. The reason that the monetary union works in the US is that the states are responsible for their own fiscal policy. States and local governments borrow on their own and are responsible for their own fiscal policy. And there is a very credible no bailout commitment. So if California is in trouble, California can run a fiscal deficit and deal with the problems that it has. And if it has run its finances well, it will be able to borrow to deal with the crisis that it confronted five years ago. If Mississippi is, well, it isn't anymore, but if, if Mississippi is not credible, then it's not going to be able to borrow to deal with its problems. So state and local governments deal with the regionally specific <laughs> characteristics of the currency area in a way that deals with these divergences. And I don't want to draw things out too much, but I think that the the, the, one of the, fun, if not the fundamental problem in the Eurozone starting in 1998 was that the no bailout commitment was not credible. That was, I think, a crucial factor in the capital flows that ensued. It was a crucial factor in the mess that resulted. Right? And for the currency union to operate, I think, as it should, some way of addressing the, bailout, the no bailout commitment in a credible way will be essential. But Paul de Graaf would disagree. Um, so that then gets to the, the role of central fiscal authority. The, the central fiscal authorities in the US in Hamilton's time controlled about as much of GDP as the European Union controls, three or four percent. Very small uh, portions of spending. Now, the federal government didn't do very much, right? It serviced the debts. I mean, that's what it was. It was, it was right. Its revenue was entirely tariffs and excise tariffs, tax. So uh, it, I'll get back to taxation in a minute. So the federal government didn't do very much. It serviced the state debts. It had a very small standing army and navy. Uh, but it did, certainly didn't carry out any fiscal stabilization. It didn't transfer funds. It didn't engage in, many, in public works of any substantial size. So the federal government didn't do much other than guarantee that whatever debts it issued would be creditworthy. And that was enough. That was enough. 
because if we went to war, we had to finance it. If we had to finance public works, we could finance them. So even with the very small federal government, the fact that it was credit worthy was central. And that was the point that Hamilton was, was really getting at. On taxation, we imposed a, a, an income tax during the Civil War uh, for the first time, and it was found unconstitutional after the war was over. So we did not get an income tax until 1913 when a constitutional amendment was passed. So the federal government did not have a federal, uh, a federal income tax until 1913. Um, the vast majority of taxation in the United States was done at the state and local level until the 1930s. It wasn't, in fact, until the 19, well, leaving aside World Wars I and II, it wasn't until, in, the, in, a, in a peacetime period, the 1950s, that the federal government actually raised more money than the state and local governments. So the, this, this notion that the American federal government was always much, much larger than the state and local governments is incorrect. For 150 years, the state and local governments did the vast majority of spending. And they did a lot of spending. The state spent a lot in, in this period. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think on just on the on the point of the the no bailout, um, uh, which uh, you know I think it's it's certainly true that this is this is a key thing that uh, the European Union uh, and the eurozone in particular is trying to to sort out at the moment. And you know I think one big difference, of course, to uh, the United States in the in the nineteenth century is that um, debt levels are much larger and the financial system is much bigger and much more exposed to, to, that, to, that, uh, to that debt. And so I think um, to really get a credible no bailout clause, uh, what we ultimately need is we need this fiscal union, banking union with a federal uh, mm -hmm. fiscal backstop. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah. that's, to my mind, that's the way I think of this. Mm -hmm. We create a proper banking union with a fiscal backstop, with um, a more integrated uh, cross-border ca operating capital markets with therefore a more stable financial system, and then this becomes actually a credible proposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that this, I mean, establishing policy credibility, there, there is no magic potion or silver bullet to establish policy credibility. So I, and you're, you're absolutely right that, that the, the circumstances of the European Union today are different in a lot of ways, but one fundamental way, speaking about state debts as opposed to national government debts, is that almost all of these state debts were owed to foreigners. So defaulting on the state debts was not going to create financial chaos or a financial crisis in the U.S. It was going to bankrupt a bunch of Englishmen and, and Dutchmen, right? Um, and so that's very important because we didn't, if, you know, we have had instances like during the Great Depression where municipal defaults threatened the financial stability of the country as a whole. And that becomes a much more complicated proposition. I mean, if we wanted to do a thought experiment and say, well, what would happen if, in fact, the state of California was so bankrupt that there was rioting in the streets and the National Guard had to be called out? Well, is it really plausible that the federal government wouldn't step in there? No, it's not. So establishing full credibility is never easy. And I understand certainly in an integrated financial system, establishing the credibility of not bailing out large banks or large states is very, very difficult. But I think that some combination of establishing the credibility of the no bailout commitment and banking and fiscal union of some form are crucially important. Right. OK, I think um, this, this brings our session uh, to, to an end. Thank you so much uh, for all the questions and the comments. And thank you to